Good morning, Last Point. Happy Easter. Anybody excited to be in church on Easter? One, two, no, I'm just kidding. All right, let's stand together. Hey, I was thinking this morning, uh, I don't have the reference for you because I didn't plan on sharing it, but there's a verse in the New Testament where Paul says that if the resurrection did not happen, then we are to be pitied above all men. All this devotion, prayer, fasting, sacrifice, saying no to certain desires, like we're really dumb if this isn't true, the way we live. But if the resurrection is true, then we have it better than anybody else on the planet because there's victory in Jesus in this life and in the next. And so today, God is worthy of worship every day, but today's a special day because we're remembering the core tenet of our faith, that Jesus died for our sins but that he rose again and we rise with him. And so this morning, I just want to encourage you, whatever you can do, just to make it personal. So Lord, I say thank you so much that you rose from the grave. And because you live, God, we live with you, Lord. That we're no longer slaves to sin and death and fear, but we're alive in Christ. And so Lord, we welcome you and we worship you. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. with me. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my dream till I met you. You called my name and I ran
my testimony. I needed rescue. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I wasn't. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name. sin was heavy, Lord. We were orphans, but you saved us, Jesus. Lord, we rejoice in you, Lord. We remember who you are, what you've done for us, Lord. Jesus' name. 
Thank you, Lord. And you deserve the praise. 
how you feel about it. If he rescued you from sin, from death, from addiction, just tell him that he's worthy. He can't just be the risen savior for the Bible. He has to be your Lord and Savior. Oh, you're worthy, Jesus. Thank you for who you are. Worthy is your name. You reign. You rose. Worthy. Sickness must bow before your name. Fear, shame, sin must bow before your name. Insecurity must bow before your name. Lord, we thank you that there's no name in heaven or on earth that's higher than your name. Because you died and rose again, the Father has given you the name above every name. So, Lord, we have faith in you. We trust you, Lord. Come on, just tell them that in your own words. Say, Lord, I trust you. I trust you, Lord. You are alive and well. I trust you with my family. I trust you with my future. Come on, no one can do that for you. No one can put your trust in Jesus but you. Lord, you're victorious.
Come on, just one more second. Lord, I trust you. Lord, I put my faith in you. Lord, we love you, Lord. We give you our worship. We welcome you here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Life Point. We are so happy to have you here with us this morning, whether you're here in person or you're tuning in online. If this is your first time with us, we would also love the opportunity to connect with you. Simply text the word hello to 903-592-8357. Again, text hello to 903-592-8357. Here at Life Point is our mission to lead people closer to God. Let's hear what he has for us in today's word. All right, well, I want to welcome you to Life Point Fellowship Church. Uh, my name is Alex Velarde. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. And um, if you're just stepping in for the first time, or maybe you haven't been here in a while, welcome. I hope you guys are doing well. Thrill to get into God's Word with you, and um, I'm so glad to do this on, on Easter Sunday. And today we're celebrating um, something. I want you to think about this for a moment. We're celebrating along with another couple of billion with a B people around the world. I'm so glad that, I mean, even though the room is full and that's incredible, I'm so glad that it's not just us celebrating, but approximately 2.18 billion people are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ today. Man, let's put our hands together for that. I'm glad that I'm not the only one doing it, you know. Uh, next week, next week, we're starting a brand new series. I want to make sure you don't miss it. Uh, the name of the series is called Love and Respect, okay? So it's not, it's not like a marriage series. It's for all people, whether you're single or married, divorced, all of it. All of it. It's a relationship. It's a series about relationships. If you want to break the cycle, it's a, it's a vicious cycle. It's a crazy cycle, destructive cycle of miscommunication, in conflict, if you want to discover the key to building strong relationships, whether it's with your spouse, your, with your kids, with your parents, if you want to find out what it is that really, like that people need, what are, what are some of the needs that people, like we all are very needy people, right? Like we, there are certain things that we need that you can provide for, for that, that other person that maybe you work with or for your children. If you want to know, you want to gain insight into the different needs that people have, come back next week for love and respect. Now, for those of you who only come uh, for Easter and Christmas, um, I know what it is that you don't come back any other time. Um, you are like, you know, every time I go, it's one of the same, it's one of two messages. You know, the sermons are always the same over and over. Christmas is about the birth of Christ. Easter is about the resurrection of Christ. So you come back next week, okay? And I promise you, you're gonna get, gain tremendous, incredible value from our new series starting next week. Now, let me tell you kind of what I wanna do today. Um, I, I want to encourage you to become a Christian, okay? I know that, in a room this size, not everybody is a believer, okay? Like some of you, you may be here because it's Easter and your family, it's the thing that you do. Some of you, you have questions about God and it's perfectly fine. We love questions. Some of you, you're here and you're like, man, my mom or my dad, they made me come or this is a thing that we always do and you're kind of dreading it, you know? I want to encourage you to become a Christian in spite of the fact that you may know some. I want to encourage you to become a Christian in spite of the fact that you may have been married to one. Or you may have worked for one. Have you ever worked for a Christian? Raise your hand. And not the good kind. <laughs> yes, I have too. I'm like, are you a Christian? Please don't tell anybody, <laughs> you know. I want to encourage you to become a Christian even if you have been hurt 
by the church, even if you think Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. Now, here's the good news. Let me start with that. Good news is that the foundation of the Christian faith is not Christians. The foundation of the Christian faith is not, it's not Christians' behavior, okay? Thank goodness. And so what I'm, I'm going to ask you today is to consider Jesus because the foundation is Jesus. Now, if you're a believer, I'm going to remind you of some things. Maybe you're here and it's been a while. And so I just want to bring some things to you that maybe, maybe a point in time you're like, oh, yeah, this is why. You know? And so I want to just remind you of why it is that you believe. So I've kind of broken up the message into three parts. The first part, and let's put it on the screen, is I want you to consider Jesus' ministry. Okay, like his work. From a, from a logical point of view, okay, uh, from a, just a, an analytical person, I just want you to consider the legacy, the work that he did, his ministry. Then number two, I want you to consider his resurrection. This is what we're celebrating today along with 2.18 billion people around the world. And then last, I want you to consider, I want you to think about his message, okay? Now, it's interesting to me because hardly anybody denies the existence of Jesus. Like, like when, you, when you look out into our world today, uh, the world today places a high value on tolerance. This, this word, right? Like high value on tolerance. When you say that, like, like when you ask people around, like you have to, it's almost like, yeah, you have to, I mean, you, all you have to do is just turn on the news to see high value on tolerance without me saying any more than that, right? And what I've, what I've learned that is I can talk to anyone about like a higher power, right? And it's fine. I, I can talk to anyone about, you know, a higher being. Like I can even use the word God or spirituality. And, and usually it's not a controversial thing. But the moment that I say the name Jesus Christ, ah, oh man, all of a sudden things get a little bit uncomfortable. Have you ever noticed that? And, and so, to me, it's interesting because hardly anyone denies the existence of Jesus. I mean, like, no rational people is, is usually, for the most part, like, no, no rational person is going, oh, no, there, there, was no, there was no historical figure named Jesus. For the most part, people will say, yeah, yeah, there was a guy that lived on planet Earth a little bit over 2,000 years ago. His name is Jesus, Okay. So to me, it's interesting because hardly anyone denies the existence of Jesus. And here's the other thing. Hardly anyone dislikes his message, his teaching. For the most part, you know, he taught us to help the poor. Ta he taught us to love one another. Like these are things that like we, the vast majority of people are like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm in with that. Like he taught us to love those that kind of the world overlooks and rejects. And so People, for the most part, do not deny his existence, and they don't debate his teachings. And so why is this such a big deal? Well, let's, let's talk about it, okay? So number one, I want you to just consider his work, his ministry, his legacy, okay? So there's, there's this guy, his name is Mark. He lived when Jesus was alive, and he says this. Let's listen to what he says. He says, but when the teachers of religious law who were Pharisees, so there was this group of people, there were, there was, it was like a sect of people, religious people called the Pharisees. And Mark says when the, the, the religious leaders, the religious teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him, saw Jesus, eating with the tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat, why does Jesus eat, eat excuse me, with such Scum. So they're, they're wondering, why is Jesus hanging out with the tax collectors? Why is Jesus hanging out with the prostitutes? Why is Jesus hanging out with this crowd? You know, the, the, the lepers, the no good, the people that, for the most part, had been isolated. Now watch what, what, what uh, verse 17 says. When Jesus heard this, he told them, watch this, watch this. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they're what? Help me out. Not those who think they're righteous, but I have come for those who know they are sinners. sinners. So I just want you to know, like Jesus came not for people who have it all together, but he came for people like 
like me who desperately need God's grace. He came for people like me who desperately need God's mercy. I mean, I'll be honest with you. Some of you guys, maybe this is your first time stepping into this room. You know, you don't really know me. But like I often, like sometimes I ask myself, man, I don't know how people can do life without God's love. You know, and I don't know if it's that I beat myself over the head too much or like, you know, like I, I don't, I show grace to others, but not to myself. But I sincerely like when I see people go through the stuff, the junk, the baggage, the, the difficult things, uh, things of life. I just honestly ask the question. I don't know how people do it without God's love. And so Jesus comes and he says, I didn't, I'm not here for those who have it all together. I'm here for those who desperately need God's grace, God's mercy. He came for those who are rejected. He came for those who have been uh, you know, cast aside by society. Jesus liked people who were nothing like him. And people who were nothing like him liked him. It's true. Let me say that again. Let me say that again. Jesus liked people who were nothing like him. The standards, the way of living, the things that they thought, the things they did, nothing like him. And those people liked him. It is true. And so when you look at his life during his public ministry, Jesus did all kinds of miracles. He healed the blind, he healed the paralytic, he multiplied the bread for the for the, to, to provide food for the crowd, turn water into wine. But even his strongest enemies did not debate the validity of his miracles. Think about that. Even the, his fiercest opponents did not ask, did not debate, did not question the validity of his miracles. They asked the question, what, what they asked was, by what power does he do this? They just wanted him to stop because he was gaining popularity. And so would you just take for the next 19 minutes and 15 seconds, that's how long we're going to go, would you just take a moment to consider from a logical perspective some of the work that he did, to his ministry, his legacy, okay? So I'll give you an example. You take, um, let's just say somebody like Nero or like somebody like Caesar Augustus, okay? And you put Jesus, Nero, and Caesar Augustus, and you just consider all three of those guys, okay? Just compare them. In my opinion, there's no comparison, okay? But two of his contemporaries, think about it for a moment. Like, Nero was a Roman emperor. You could not tell me three things that he did as an emperor, unless you're like a historian, okay? But uh, maybe you can think, oh yeah, he's the guy that, sent Christians, like he fed Christians to the lions, remember? Okay, that's, that's Nero. You take somebody like Caesar Augustus, okay? Um, first Roman emperor. He made all kinds of um, reforms in Rome. You could not name, for the most part, I don't think you could name one thing that Caesar Augustus said or did one of those reforms. But watch this, watch this. Every Christmas... In languages you've never heard, in cities that you've never visited, the name Caesar Augustus is mentioned. Not because of all the reforms, not because of all the great accomplishments, but because he has become a footnote in the story of Christmas, in the birth of Christ. So every, every Christmas, his name is mentioned as the story of Christmas is told. And so I want you to think about these things with me. Think about it just for why do millions of people, and I know that sometimes it feels like we're you know, fighting a battle that we're losing, and when you look at the news, and when you see what's going on, and it's like, how could this be, and where are we headed as a country? But just for a moment, can we celebrate the fact that there are millions upon millions upon millions of people today that are in church celebrating, some of them maybe watching from home, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're followers of Jesus. And so would you just take a moment and think, just consider his work. Here's the second thing that I want you to do. I want you to think about his resurrection. Okay, think about, that's what we're celebrating. Think about that. Now, you may ask questions like, how do I really know, Pastor Alex, that the resurrection of Jesus actually happened? Like, how do I know that 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 he actually was resurrected? I mean, what if the Romans stole the body and that's why we we did not they did not find him in the tomb three days later it's a great question 
And what if, what if the disciples they just had so much zeal that, that they just lied about it? Okay, and it's, it's, it's all a lie. Right, if you have those kinds of questions, that's good. Questions are good as long as you don't let them dictate your life, okay? Because I have questions about faith too, okay? Like, but I try not to, you know, I try to dig in. I try to do research. I try to look at things from an analytical point of view, which is what I want to do with you today. So you ask the question, what if the Romans stole the body? You know, that's why we don't see him three days later. The tomb is empty. What if the disciples died? Great question. So let's look at it real quick. Just give me like five minutes. Let's look at it from the point of view of the Romans, for example. Okay. Did you know that there was a Roman centurion, like a, a Roman officer, who was not a Jesus follower? Okay? And history tells us that when this guy, when he saw what, like he was there alive when Jesus died and he experienced the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and this guy says, then when he experienced that, his words, for sure... This had to be the son of God. That's what he said. Now, the Romans, they would have loved nothing more than to produce a dead body to prove that Jesus was not resurrected. They would have loved that. Remember, they were trying to slow down this movement that Jesus had gotten started. I mean, Christianity was a threat for the Roman Empire. So they, were, they would have loved to do nothing else to produce a dead body. But instead, many of those Roman soldiers, you know what they did? They said, and it's, it's, you can look it up. You, it's, you know, it's not just in the Bible. It's recorded in history. And they, these people went on the record and they said, Listen, we did not believe before. But we've seen some things and we believe now. Now, look at it from the, the point of view of the disciples, okay? So, uh, Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, he's talking to a bunch of religious people, and he says this to them. Acts 3.15, he says, You killed the author of life, in, in reference to Jesus. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are, <clears throat> help me out, church, and we are witnesses. witnesses. Of this very fact. So Peter is looking at these people. He says, you've killed the author of life. God raised him. But we're witnesses. Like, we've, we've seen him. Now, if you're looking at, it, at this from the point of view of the disciples, you, you know, you're thinking, okay, what's going on here? Well, ten, I want you to get this, ten of the eleven remaining disciples. Remember, Judas committed suicide. He hung himself after he betrayed Jesus. So 10 out of the 11 remaining disciples died as martyrs. 10 out of the 11 died as martyrs. Now you may, you may be here and you may say, well, they died for the message of Jesus. They wanted to carry on. You know, no, 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 no. I don't think so. I, I, I don't. If, let me, let's, let's put things in, in context, okay, for just a moment. When you look and what the disciples were doing the moment that Jesus was arrested, the moment that he was on the cross, what did the disciples do? Every single one of them fled. Every single one of them went into hiding. And in fact, the people who write the story of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, those guys, they present themselves in the story as cowards. Like if you're writing a fictitious story, you don't... Make yourself the coward. No, you, you're, if, it's a, it's, if it's a lie, you're going to make yourself look good. You're the hero of the story. And yet, 10 out of the 11 disciples died as martyrs. They say, look, when Jesus was arrested, we didn't know what to do. We were afraid to death, so we just ran. When Jesus died on the cross, he was our savior. He was a leader. For three and a half years, people, people's lives were radically changed, but we were lost. We went into hiding. They didn't know what to do until they saw him. Days, like hours before the cross, they ran. He dies, they're hiding. Days after the resurrection, they start preaching publicly. 
And they begin, they have a, a four point message. Point number one you killed him. They're talking about, they're, they're talking to people who've said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. They're, they're talking about things and events that happen in those cities. We're not talking about like a hundred years later. No, we're talking about days later. They're looking at the very people that said crucified him. And they're saying, four point message. Number one, you killed him. Number two, God raised him. Number three, we have seen him. Number four, now say you're sorry. <laughs> right? And 10 out of 11 paid for it with their very own lives. I think they would have died for a lie? Man, I don't know about you, but any logical person would think, there's no way. You killed him? God raised him? Seen him? Repent. You look at it from the point of view of Thomas. Thomas was one of his disciples. Uh, I love Thomas because he was known as a, Thomas the doubter. He always needed a little bit more evidence. I can relate to Thomas. Now, you may look at me and you may think I'm a man of faith and all of that, but man, that's the last way I would describe myself because I have so many more doubts than moments of faith in my life. And, and I know that when sometimes we put preachers on a pedestal and all of that, but listen, you know, I, I wish I was not the way that I am sometimes, but, you know, like I constantly am wrestling in my brain, you know, with, you know, Lauren, what are you doing? What are, you know, and it's just, it's more doubts and moments of faith. And so I can relate to Thomas. I'm like, yeah, I can see, like, I'm like this guy. And Thomas always needed a little bit more proof, okay? He always needed a little bit, very analytical. And even as I preach his message to you, I'm coming at it from that angle because of the way God made me, I guess, you know? Thomas, the doubter, took the gospel to India. He became the first evangelist to India. And when they said to him, Thomas, deny your faith. Deny your faith and we'll, we'll let you live. But if you stand by Jesus... For Jesus, we're going to kill you. And Thomas the doubter said, and I'm quoting, I will never deny the faith of the one who died and rose again for me. I will stand by him for the rest of my life. You know what they did to doubting Thomas? They drove a stake straight through his body. They impaled him. This is not something that you do. You don't face that kind of death for a lie. Does that make sense? I, and I don't know if you know this, but for about 250 to 300 years after Jesus dies, um, they didn't have uh, like a New Testament Bible, okay? So for about 250, 300 years, there was no meetings like this, no Bible studies, no life groups where somebody would come together and say, okay, now turn to the gospel of Matthew or turn to the you know, book of Ephesians. No, no, they, 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 250, 300 years, no, in fact, the phrase New Testament appears about 250 years after Jesus was crucified. And so the question is asked, how in the world did this movement that Jesus had gotten started, how in the world did it not die? How in the world did it keep going? And not just keep going, but how did it continue to grow? I mean, there's no way. Um, for about 200 to 300 years, Rome, the Roman Empire, and the Jewish authorities teamed up to destroy this movement called the way. That's what Christians were called, the way. Okay, That's what believers, Jesus followers were called. Okay, And nowadays, so no New Testament, okay? But nowadays, there's no more Roman Empire. And there are far, far, far more Christians. And, and so, I mean, a third of the world believes. And so, in my opinion, there's no way, unless this is a God thing, a supernatural thing, there's no way that this is, this is all based on a lie. And I'm talking to you as a logical, rational person, down to earth, not a religious nut, not a madman. It laughed at me when I said that in the first service. I didn't quite get it, you know. And so would you consider, 
Would you consider his ministry? I'm begging you. Would you consider his resurrection? Look into it. Do some research if you have questions. And then the last thing is, would you consider his message? Consider the message of Jesus. Why is he such a polarizing personality? Well, our world today says all roads lead to God. That's what our world says, right? You know, uh, as long as, you know, it doesn't really matter what you believe, as long as you are sincere. If you're sincere, it's all good. All world religions are essentially the same. But I want you to look at Jesus' message. In John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, I'm the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father. No one gets to God except through me. I am, that's the message. Of, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to God except through me. And I honestly don't know why so many people are offended by that. When you look at the message of Christianity, like in Romans, there's this verse, if we can put it up. Um, there's this verse, Romans 3.22, that says, here's, here's Christianity in a nutshell, okay? Here it is. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. So that, this is the message of the gospel. This is the message of Christianity. And, and I, honestly, I don't know um, why people are offended by this. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, you know who he was talking to, by the way? Doubting Thomas. And so I love that Romans says, anyone, this is true for anyone who believes, no matter who we are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how bad you've been. It doesn't matter how messed up your life is right now. It doesn't matter uh, how many people have been, you know, uh, the people that you've hurt, how many times you've sinned. You're not made right with God by being good enough. That's what the gospel says. That's what the, the book says. You're made right with God because Jesus was perfect and he took on the penalty of your sins. He paid the price. Now, I'll close by saying this, okay? Have you ever heard of um, this Japanese artwork called Kintsugi? And I think, I think that's how you say it. Anybody? Raise your hand real quick. I just want to see. Any, any of you guys heard? Okay, one, two, a couple of people. Kintsugi. I think I'm saying it right. If I'm not, let me know. Nobody told me that I was saying it wrong after the first service. But Kintsugi. Everybody say it. Say it with me. Kintsugi. Kintsugi. Say it one more time. Like, like, you, like you speak Japanese. All right? Kintsugi. Oh, come on. You can play along. Say it one more time. Ready? Go, go. There you go. That's much better. So Japanese artwork. Actually, I have a picture. It's, um, the word actually, it's translated it's, um, as uh, golden repair. Golden repair. Japanese art, basically, where they take broken pottery and they mend it. They, um, they repair that with gold. Okay? And it comes from the philosophy that says that we would rather embrace this object with all of the flaws and with all of the imperfections of the object, as we, we think those flaws, those, those imperfections, we see them as valuable parts of its history. So we would rather embrace that object with all of its brokenness because of its history than, than to hide it, okay? We would rather embrace that object that's broken than to you know, get, get rid of it or cast it aside. And I think that this is the message of the gospel, because the Bible says that God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. So I want you to know that he is for you, regardless of what you've been going through, regardless of whether you think that uh, there's this God who's judging me, who doesn't like me because I don't do this, or I, you know, I failed at this, or I, you know, I have temptations and desires. That man, if anybody would knew, like they would think I'm like, no, 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 no. He is for you. And what I love, if we can put the, what I love about the verse is that it says, let's go back to the verse. It, was, it happened while we were still what? This is a message of the gospel. And in the same way, God would rather embrace you with your flaws 
with your imperfections, with your doubts, with the things that you nobody knows about you. And instead of saying shame on you, he's saying shame off you. Amen. You're more valuable to me because I see the history of what God is doing in your life. I want to embrace you in spite and despite of your imperfections and your flaws. If you don't get anything else, I hope that you get this. This is what I call the difference between religion and relationship. And I want you to get this, please. Jesus did not come to start a religion. He came to offer us eternal life. He came to show us what God's love truly is all about. That's why he was hanging out with the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the people, the, the lepers and the people that everybody else said, oh, no, 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 we don't rub our noses with those. And when he comes, Jesus says, there's no greater love than, for, than, to, lay one's, than to lay down one's life for one's friend. There's, no great, there's nothing greater. And so religion is about how you perform. And you've got to, some of you that have this perfectionist mindset, you've got to get rid of that. Because relationship with God is about how Jesus performed. Religion says, if you work hard enough, maybe God will accept you. Maybe you'll be able to receive God's love. But relationship says, no, 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 no. Because I accept His love for me. And I recognize His redemption plan in my life. Man, all I want to do is serve Him and follow Him and be the best Jesus follower. I'm not signing up for a religion. I, God knows that my life is screwed up. God knows that sometimes I get it right, but I often get it way more wrong than right. And so I am here, God, and I receive your love. And so I'm when I get off track, God, you've created this wonderful thing you call repentance. And it's not a threat. It's just a, it's just a tool for me to get back on track. And it's the, the difference between religion and relationship with God. Religion is all about what you do. Relationship with God is what Jesus has already done for you. Would you consider the message of Jesus that you're not made right with God by your own works but that you were made right with God because of his grace because of his love for you with heads bowed and eyes closed I'm wondering how many of you would say pastor would you pray for me would you raise your hand I wonder how many of you would say pastor would you pray for me I want to rededicate my life to Christ or I want to accept him maybe Maybe it's been a while. I see that hand. I see the hand. I see the hand. I see the hand. K keep it up real quick. I just want to pray with you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm not here to point fingers. I'm here to I just want to be your spiritual cheerleader if you allow me. Hands all over the place, God. And so if you're here today, would you consider Jesus in spite of the fact that you may have been hurt by a Christian? in spite of the fact that you may think that they're a bunch of hypocrites and we are sorry I'll be the first one to admit it I just want to pray for you anyone else the Bible says if you declare with your mouth if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved it doesn't say anything about joining a denomination it doesn't say anything about giving money to the church. It doesn't say anything about a to-do list. It doesn't say about how you, you've screwed up. No, 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 no. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that word Lord is an archaic word. It means boss. So if today if you say, okay, God, I want you to be my boss. I surrender. I want you to be the boss of my life. If you believe that in your heart, the Bible says that you'll be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with the heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess your faith and are saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with the heart. You don't need me. 
I'm not your priest. You don't need to go through me to get to God. All you need is a heart for Jesus. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith. That's how you tell others. It is with your mouth that, you're, that you profess your faith and are saved. And so one last time, if today you want to put your heart, you want to give your life to Jesus, would you raise your hand? I just want to pray with you. I see that hand, man. I see that hand. I see that hand. Most importantly, God sees your heart. God, give us the courage, not necessarily to strive for perfection, but to surrender to your grace and your love. God, thank you for the significance of this day. We're not alone. God, I'm thankful that you use people like Thomas who doubted you time and time again. I'm thankful that you use people like Peter who denied you when it counted most, when it mattered most, it denied you. And God, I pray that you would use each one of those hands that went up with all of our flaws, with all of our difficulties, with all of our doubts. Would you help us, God? Would you do a work in us that is real? Not that it's, God, we don't want religion. We want a relationship with you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you all stand? Let, let's give it up for those people that raised their hand. Come on, we can do a little bit better than that. Come on, let's give it up for everybody that raised their hand. Love it. Thank you, Lord. God, thank you for your work. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We worship you. the
has absolutely no idea what you're fighting but the truth is is we know how the story ends it ends with Jesus rising from the dead with him defeating death with him knowing that you're broken with him knowing that you may feel discouraged that you may feel marginalized that you may feel disconnected wherever it is that you are I promise God knows where you are too and he's already won and so this morning, I am so glad that you chose to come to Life Point to celebrate Easter Sunday. If this is your first time here, Life Point, how do we feel about our first time guest? That's right, that's right. If you're here for the first time, I promise we're not gonna spam you, we're not gonna blow up your phone. But if you'll, the easiest way to connect, if you'll pull your phone out and text the word hello to our church's phone number, it's 903 903- 592-8357. We just want to begin a conversation with you wherever it is that you are on this journey. Life Point's goal is to help one another find our way closer to God. And maybe maybe you've been coming for a little while now and you're like, okay, I want to I want to keep getting connected. That number is a perfect place for you to begin that conversation as well. Or another super easy way to just begin to connect is here in just two weeks on April 14th following our second service right around 12 30 12 40 we're going to meet together over at winchester park in chandler for a picnic hamburgers and hot dogs will be provided and we're just going to have a good time together and community hanging out getting to know one another a little bit a little bit better man i i appreciated what alex said at the beginning of his sermon when he said you know it's it's easy to think that there are only a couple sermons that get preached at church but i'm super excited for what's what's going to come next week in fact i got the email i don't know a week ago when it said we've got this new series called love and respect and, and i started looking at it and went, i'm i'm divorced like i don't know that this really a- applies to me at this stage of my life and the more that i've kind of dug into it the, the reality is is that we are all in relationship whether we're married or dating, whether we're working with someone alongside someone, whether you have students or kids that you are parents to, or 
you have parents that you're kids to, or you have other students at school that you interact with. So I really want to encourage you and invite you to come join us again next week as we start our new series on all relationships and just some practical ways that we can walk through life with other people. One of the initiatives that we have been in for a little while now is called our Heart for the House. And man, I am so excited because we were able to install some security, some, some updated security cameras throughout the church, specifically as we think about the safety of our children. It has is, it is taken us to the next level. And, and to this point, we have raised $20,142.74. Your generosity is not unnoticed, and it goes a long way in continuing the kingdom of God and what God's doing in this place. And so finally, if you've come prepared to give, there are three ways you can give. You can text that word, or you can text the word give to that phone number, 903-592-8357. You can go online to lifepointfc.com slash give, or there are boxes in the back. As you leave here, whether you are thrilled and encouraged or broken and discouraged or marginalized or wherever you may be, being encouraged that we know how the battle is won. Let's finish with worship. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. But chain break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. But you call me a citizen. Come on, church. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open. Because when you call my name. you said pastor not shame on you but shame off of you guys go have a great week amen